on this episode of China Unscripted, why U.S. businesses should get out of China now. The Commerce Department approves the sale of sensitive military tech to China and China's looming economic crisis. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And my goal today is to get Shelley to quit by going into some kind of red terror rant. Do you actually want me to quit? No, that'd be very bad for me. <laughs> then it would just be you and me on the whole rest of the hour. That would be how many dangerous. more strips scripts would you guys have to edit and write? Oh, without oh, you mean like you quit the entire show? Oh, wow, that's yeah, what yeah, I no, thought what, you meant. No, you meant you just want me to storm off the podcast. Yes, I I have limits. Okay. Yeah, you're 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 way too valuable. Otherwise, yeah. that's the problem. So, anyways, uh, McCarthy was an anti-communist American hero. Shelley, your thoughts. <sighs> I feel like that clip is just going to be taken out of context. Well, we have the clip prove. of me uh, <laughs> like with like a tiki torch making an OK symbol that's already floating around the Internet. Yeah. But you know what clip of you has the most views? It's actually uh, the one where you talk about how China has what are they? They've they've killed the wither and created a nether beacon. Yeah. Yeah. Because they th when they shot a hypersonic missile, we could maybe play the clip. This is why you come to China Uncensored to get the facts. I can tell you what this really means. It means China has successfully killed the wither and now has the resources necessary to activate a beacon. But yeah, they they fired the hypersonic missile and it looks like just a straight beam of light shooting up into the sky, which is just like in Minecraft if you activate a beacon. So basically- It has we, millions of views, it's crazy. We should just start a Minecraft China channel. Well, we kind of are in soft launch of our other uh, channel, Gamers Unbeaten, where there is some Minecraft content up there. Not Minecraft and China, though. Uh, not yet. I mean, Someone suggested I, I, we build like Zhong Nanhai a... in Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which is an idea. Yeah, an I idea. mean, it's, it is possible to do. Um, it, would, it would be a substantial amount of work, I think. Um, so please check out Gamers Unbeaten. And now I think we can get into some actual discussion of news, but don't, don't worry, That's we won't go good. into the red terror rant. I'll save that for social media late at night. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The well, best place for rants. Of course, uh, except for Twitter, because it's just with the limitations on characters, it's just so hard to rant. That That's why you do like does one not out of 22. People. One out of 22. There are people who do one out of like 213 or something like that threads it is horrifying yeah, i wonder if the, the ancient the, world the, had the, any the, equivalent the max to should only be like out of 320 because that would be the build limit never mind um let's talk about china news so shelly before we began you were telling us about this this interview with uh the the chinese ambassador Qinggan with uh, was it was with, with the u.s ambassador He's no, he well, he's the Chinese ambassador to the US. Yes. And then he had a it's unusual because they don't usually give any kind of press availability. They don't exactly hold press conferences and things like that. I wonder why. Right. But he had a special kind of joint interview where they invited like AP, Reuters, New York Times, Washington Post, like all these major US media and basically let them ask him questions. What, what did they think was going to happen? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think it was definitely an attempt to change the narrative about like Pelosi's, like to basically to get the Chinese, it's like, you know, it's an attempt to get the Chinese Communist Party messaging out there. But the reaction from the journalists, the articles I read were mostly like, we had to listen to him lie for an hour, you know? I mean, said uh -huh. in more than, uh, actually, I think the Washington Post, Josh Rogan actually did say that, like, we the journalists were just listening to him lie or say things that were completely untrue. Um, which which sounds like fun. Like, I wish I we could have been there and been like, so what happened in... Uh Tiananmen on June 4th, 1989. Uh, well, he has to admit that happens in a room full of Western journalists, right? Well, no, but, I mean, he could go with the line of like, you know, no students were killed in Tiananmen Square. Or there were like insurrectionists or right. whatever. Yeah, and the Politico reporter said in his like China newsletter that it was basically like sitting through an hour of invective. So 
invective. Like ranting. Of oh. Like, you know, like kind of oh. like, like. <laughs> I thought that was like some barbs. new social media thing. Oh. <laughs> Which maybe it should be. Invective. That's basically Twitter. Yeah. Um, but it, but it sounds like a like a highbrow name, you know. But what was interesting to me is that the People's Daily then published a transcript of this entire thing. Really? Yeah, which is weird. Weird. And it was uncensored. Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask the American journalists if everything they said was in there. I haven't seen any reactions to it because they just published it this morning. The only way to make sure it's accurate is to have some uh, one of the Western media publish its own transcript, right? Yeah. I mean, it is interesting because it starts off with like some pointed questions um, from the Washington Post, Josh Rogan, about Taiwan. And one of the questions he asks is, so if you're doing all this great stuff for Taiwan and, you know, reunification is, you know, everything that you say it's going to be, why do the majority of people in Taiwan not you know, want to reunify. Like, what are you doing to, are you, do you think you're winning them over? And then he can't say yes. So he just goes into this weird kind of baby, like, what do you call that? Like tangent, tangent, right? I, I was thinking offshoot in my head and being like, there's another word. He went into this weird tangent about all the, the fact that like a million Taiwanese people live in mainland China and they're doing so much business between Taiwan and China. It's just, Funny to watch him try to like wriggle out of it. Basically. Did he talk about all the Chinese dumplings you can get in Taiwan? Because that was that was the point that uh, Hua Chunying mentioned on Twitter. Yeah, because there are lots of Chinese regional restaurants in Taiwan, which proves that Taiwan is part of China. Hundred percent. A lot of Chinese restaurants in America. I like the response where somebody said on Twitter that you know there are so many KFCs in China. Kentucky must reclaim its ancestral lands. You Which know? is a shame because Popeye's is clearly the superior fried chicken. Ah, uh, but KFC got there first. That's true. That's that's very true. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how um, uh, Pelosi's visit to Taiwan has really sort of, I feel like in a lot of way, turned to key. Uh, because, I mean, over actually this year, there's been like, what, 10 congressional delegation. I didn't even know Taiwan. that was that many. Ned Price, the U.S. State Department spokesperson, said 10 or more. Yeah, yeah. which is a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, well, no, it should be seen as like commonplace and actually not enough, really. But in the horrible U.S.-China-Taiwan relations we are in, 10 is quite significant, 10 delegations. Yeah, I mean, not all of them have been very publicized. Like I was actually, I found that quote because I was trying to count up how many delegations there were were at, through like news, news articles. And I didn't, I counted seven between last year and this year. And then I found that press conference where he said 10 and I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was surprised. And like, uh, I guess like a, Jap- a Japanese delegation is coming soon. Uh, there was a Lithuanian one pretty recently. Uh, nobody would have known about the Lithuanian one, really. I mean, the person, the deputy minister tweeted about it, mm-hmm. but then because China, freaked out and sanctioned her for visiting Lithuania. Suddenly, this is international news. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for her visiting Taiwan. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, it does seem like there is kind of a, dare I say, zeitgeist of, uh, you know, sort of a push to recognize Taiwan more. I mean, maybe, maybe it was the, the invasion of Ukraine that kind of sparked a lot of this. I think maybe for a lot of people, it was kind of like, oh, this, an authoritarian regime invading a independent country maybe isn't that far-fetched in the 21st century. I think what actually happened is that everybody read the new Chinese white paper on Taiwan and then they They were very concerned. They were very concerned because after then they also this. read the 1993 and 2000 versions and then compared them. That's right. Yeah. It's a I mean we did an episode about that. It is amazing how significant the change is cuz I mean, you know, you kind of think, you know, China authoritarian regime is going to invade, but there were some pretty big changes between the 93 and 2000 one. It's gotten a lot more invadey. <laughs> Well, yeah, also, you have to remember where relations were. I don't were. have to remember anything, Shelley. <laughs> uh, in 2000, right, this is kind of the time when there was a lot more opening up between the two countries. Because, like, it into was, the 90s, there was very little 
uh, like you couldn't barely get flights between China and Ta- like there mm-hmm. had to be special like if you wanted to people who were in Taiwan who had family members in mainland China and wanted to visit them had to get like special permission like yeah. there was not really much going back and forth and then you know in the 2000s I think was then when like all these business ties started being made I think it was also the time when the CCP was probably like we could we could do a Hong Kong thing. Well, yeah, in particular, at this point in time, like like especially when the other second white paper, the 2000 white paper came out, they were pushing the one country, two system things. And at that point, it kind of seemed like one country, two systems was working in Hong Kong. They had just, you know, it had been three years for Hong Kong and one year for Macau. Yeah, and it hadn't, Hong Kong had not become uh, the disaster that it had eventually became. Um, So it it, it seemed like there might have been a little more credibility of like, oh, yeah, we can do this one country, two systems things. But now that is obviously out of the table because we have seen where that. I mean, they're still saying that, right? Like the white paper still said Hong Kong, like Taiwan can keep its democracy. Quote, unquote. (laughs) Yeah. But at the same time, uh, they're going to purge any separatists and uh, launch a re-education campaign. Oh, the re-education thing came from the. Chinese like ambassador. No. It was the it was the Chinese ambassador to France. That's right. Um, you yeah, gotta but that, think but that's that what these... you need for democracy, Shelley. Reeducation. That's right. Mm. Specifically, reeducation camps. Yeah. And then it was the Chinese ambassador to Australia who said, uh, you know, the the line about you know what what will the takeover look like? Use your imagination. You can use you can use your imagination. Like, Chinese ambassadors suck. I mean, they're limited to what they can say, right? But yeah, but also they're supposed threats. to be diplomats. It, yeah. it is kind of fun. I wonder, though, now that you mentioned, because we just talked about the Chinese ambassador to France saying something, the mm-hmm. Australian one. He That was at a, like, big, like, he gave a speech, right, at this think tank or something in Australia. Uh-huh. So, and now Qing Gang, the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., had this, you know, on-the-record interview I wonder if they're being told essentially that like they need to do some kind of like soft power push right now. Well, yeah, I wonder if the strategy is like, all right, start talking aggressive. So, you know, the hope is that other countries will be get afraid like, oh, we, we, we really better not push mm. them because otherwise, you know, oh, gosh, they they'll might might they might do something. I mean, the Qinggongs wasn't aggressive in the sense like he did. If you if you think that what the Chinese ambassador to Australia said was aggressive, Qinggong didn't say anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, he basically was trying to play dumb. Like when the the New Yorker reporter asked, "What would what are they prepared for?" And like the international uh, world's reaction if they do something to Taiwan, and Qinggong was like, "What would what what do you mean?" Like, what would we do, be doing? And then uh, the Washington Post reporter said, if you attack Taiwan, and then he was like, well, that's just an internal matter. That doesn't, like, the like the international community shouldn't have any reaction to that because it has nothing to do with them. But the question you know? wasn't whether they should. It's a question of what would they have. And if they're prepared to, you know, deal with the consequences. I mean, of that, like, they, so. they can't possibly imagine in like like in their own internal things they can't imagine that they invade they 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 liberate taiwan no no uh, no matt it's it's reunify they 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 reunify with a, a country that was never part of the prc and then the rest of like the, do they imagine the rest of the world is going to be like you know what you're right this is your internal affair you know they wouldn't have been that uh unjustified in believing that i think yeah, up until very recently. Well, you know, yeah. this this reminds me of something I want to talk about in a little bit, but like some of the stuff we found out about the Commerce Department. No. Yeah, I mean, even without like incompetence or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, it is also just, you know, you see people talking in opinion articles all the time about like, you know, we should not get into a war with China over Taiwan. Yeah. You know, like it's like there's a lot of that kind of talk out there. So before the invasion of Ukraine, especially as you pointed out, Chris, like there was, there's a sea change in a lot of things that I think they wouldn't have been, it's not like they're crazy to think that maybe they could just get away with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were like after the end, the Cold War never ended. All right. That's not a rage quit for you. Good. Uh, I guess we've, I guess we've heard too much about that, but uh, I mean, yeah, just, there was so much like, okay, 
we're at the end of history. There's no more going to, no more inv- countries aren't going to invade each other. We're done. Things are good. Nobody really wanted to, in the West, wanted to acknowledge like, well, you know, there are still really aggressive authoritarian states that have ambitions that don't jive with the international. So we're I think also we're, because in 1991 or whatever, like when the Berlin Wall fell, when the Soviet Union started to break up in the early 90s, China wasn't that like powerful of a country Mm -hmm. yeah reflected in the white paper on taiwan yeah now do you remember when russia invaded crimea in 2014 oh i don't because i don't remember it i don't have to remember anything yeah (laughs) like what what international reaction it was just russia reclaiming part of russia from like the like if you if you try to like look back at that there was like a bit of media outrage and then resuming normal relations with Russia. What was going on in 2014? Like, like what was the big story back then? I don't remember. I, I, I oh, think, no. well, that was, that was well, no, so long re- ago. Remember the, the Obama administration, and I think Hillary Clinton in particular, or Secretary of State a couple years earlier, had tried to do a Russia reset, right? Uh, that was significantly earlier than the, that was like 2008. That was, the, that was Obama's yeah. first term. Yes. Yeah. Right, but I mean, like, there was this idea that that the U.S. could kind of, well, yeah, reset relations with Russia mm-hmm. and have treat Russia like a normal country, a normal democracy, and not like a, you know, Putin dictatorship. Uh, and it didn't. I I'm sorry, make Matt. Russia democratic. I, w- I got to know what shell. Oh, I laughed because I I looked up what happened in 2014, and. One of the things that happened was the Sochi Olympics, which I can't believe I oh. forgot because that's when it happened, right? Like yeah. They, yeah, 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 yeah. The, wow, the, the doping Olympics. But, yeah, well, but, we found out they were all doping Olympics. But the Sochi Olympics specifically—that's when Putin like uh, did his little strategic military operation. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I think, but but that is a very good point. Like the invasion of Crimea should have sparked something but for some reason was ukraine where like people finally were like oh gosh something like this can happen in the 21st century yeah like like I, but like, what's the difference between taking a part of ukraine and taking the entire ukraine you i know? think there is a difference because you know when biden was asked about prior to the invasion of mm-hmm. ukraine like the u.s had been kind of saying that Russia is going to do something, right? Uh, and then there was a question asked to Biden at a press conference about what would the reaction to that be? And Biden was kind of like, well, it depends on what they do. Depends how much of Ukraine uh, He didn't take say over. that specifically, but he That's said something he about a minor incursion, which essentially, I think a lot of people expected them to uh, try to get the Donbas region, mm-hmm. essentially, like do like a small, like what they did in Crimea, like take a small part. And not like go straight for Kiev. Uh, so I think that was, if you think about that in terms of China and Taiwan, it would be like taking Jinmen. Yeah, taking Jinmen or Matsu or some of the outlying islands or maybe taking their island in the South China Sea. Like, what would the international reaction to that be? Probably pretty tepid. Well, I mean, the international reaction to the CCP trying to take Jinmen in the 1950s. Well, that was the first 60s. and second Taiwan Straits crisis. That's a good point. When right. Americans like, knew the threat of communism. <laughs> and uh, and we supported Taiwan in fighting the Red Terror. Didn't, was it Eisenhower? Did he like threaten a nuke to nuke China? Am I making that up? That wasn't. I, I'm pretty sure that was our YouTube commentators. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there was a threat of. It, Eisenhower wasn't. I might be wrong. Per, I, no. I'm not sure. Well, Too many. I I have forgotten more things about China than most people ever learned. Uh, so, but at any rate, like, what would happen if today the, the PRC tried to take over one of those outlying islands that are administered by the Republic of China, i.e., Taiwan? Like it's, it's a really good question. And also, I think a lot of it depends on when they would make that move. You know, like right now, like with the context of Ukraine, I think people would be more outraged. What happens if it's two years from now, four years from now, seven years from now? Will people, what, what will people care about then? 
Yeah, I mean, you could you can also imagine that like the the Chinese Communist Party has had quite a bit of success with salami slicing over the last decade or so. Explain yeah. that. So the salami slicing is when that was my Larry King. Okay, I, uh, I, I was, was wondering. wondering. Going for it, yeah. So basically, instead of doing one big takeover of Taiwan or, or India or the South China Sea, they just do little by little by little by little, and each individual step seems small enough that to react to that might seem like an overreaction because everything is is a sort of short of war tactic. I mean, there was a reaction, but it was often like not, it was often a reaction that was like, yes, yes, finger wagging. Finger wagging and, and not on the level of what the PRC had done. So like they salami slice into the South China Sea gradually, right? Bit by bit. So first they claim, they draw the nine dash line and say, it's been part of Chinese territory since ancient times. And they, you know, come up with some old maps and okay, fine. The people are like, oh, well, that's not true, but it doesn't really matter because they're not doing anything there. You don't want to have a war over a fake map. Right. It doesn't matter, right? And then, you know, oh, they sort of move some ships in to the to some of those islands and shoals. Okay. But like, not a big deal. They start to fill them in with sand and, and build up the area. But it, it's like what like it's not they say they're not going to militarize they they promise obama in the rose garden xi jinping says we're not going to militarize i've been to that rose garden it's lovely and they have photos of that meeting all over the place yeah it's oh, so really? it's, it's beautiful yeah. right and it's like well okay look if you promise you're not going to militarize then it doesn't seem like that big a deal like what kind of reaction should we have to just like you know, doing this, maybe it's for commercial reasons, whatever. And then they start to militarize. And that definitely should have been a part where there's a big reaction, but they also kind of did that gradually. There was no big announcement. Of course not. I mean, basically people found, like were taking satellite images and they're like, okay, this looks, this looks like a hangar. But, but this at this like, point, you know, like, what are you going to do? Because there's already a big Chinese presence there. So if you, if you, you know. And they previously moved Right. And so once there's civilians there, you can't just bomb it. And of course, bombing it anyway would be, from the PRC's perspective, an act of war, right? So they're they're putting civilians there and then military facilities is not, from their perspective, an act of war, but a reaction to that would be an act of war. So they kind of set this up where they can gradually do what they want, but any reaction that the US or foreign countries have is an extreme overreaction that would then trigger a war between China and the US. So we're like, America is always falling for this trap because we, we, don't, we don't do reactions big enough to deal with each slice of the salami. I think we're, it's also that we, have a, a, we don't have a good, like proactive policy for certain things, like it's very reactive, right? Right. Well, I think what's interesting is like this salami slicing strategy is something the U.S. can adopt as well. And maybe they are to an extent. Like, you know, China, you know, threatens all kinds of war if the U.S. supports Taiwan. Well, the U.S. sends some congressmen to Taiwan. Well, that's not a big deal. They can't like have a war over that. They can't actually pull the trigger on invasion. Oh, now it's Nancy Pelosi who's visiting Taiwan. Well, that's a bigger escalation, but that's, you know, still you don't want to actually do the invasion just because of that. I mean, also and, they can't, right? And now, they but... can, yeah. So like if the U.S. keeps doing like these little progressions, like, okay, now well, what's next after, this is what the, like the State Department should be thinking of. What's next after Nancy Pelosi? Maybe station some troops there or have a aircraft carrier dock. Uh, there can be this yeah. gradual kind of progression of U.S. support for Taiwan that never triggers a response. I think the, I mean, the the fact that there have been Marines on there, just, you know, a few mm -hmm. um, that came out and then, like, the CCP was upset, but then they couldn't do anything about it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, when we had Germont Leilari on, he suggested, well, maybe this year it could be 10, maybe next year it could be 100. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of what you're talking about, this, like, gradual build up kind of scenario. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the next step actually is going to be economic ties with Taiwan. Well, there is going to be to uh, trade talks coming up, right? Yeah. They announced that they were going to do some kind of like trade talks during the, uh, like back in June, but mm -hmm. 
this week they announced that they come up with a framework and the talks are actually going to start next month. Cool. Yeah. So. Well, speaking of trade, I think that's a great segue into the fury I feel at the Commerce Department. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Shall we get into that one? Yeah. So you know, you know how. China is an authoritarian state, and there's really no separation between any state-run military uh, industrial complex and any private Chinese company in China. Well, it, I mean, it, there's a separation, but they can take whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. civil well, military well, I mean, they, fusion. Uh, they officially have that policy of civil military yeah. fusion. Yep. Uh, and so the way that the U.S. has dealt with this is, you know, there's like an entity list. You're not supposed to – there are restrictions on trade with Chinese companies tied to – the military, for instance, which, as we just said, is stupid because they're all there's no such thing as a private Chinese company. Well, there are such things as private Chinese company. I'm just saying that, like, if it's the military wants something, they can take they it. They can though. take it. Yeah. yeah. So if you give sensitive technology to a private Chinese company that has military application, the Chinese military can just take it. But anyways, the point is, like, supposedly there were all these, you know, restrictions on uh, U.S. companies trading sensitive technology with China, particularly things that have military applications. Well, apparently I come to find out that uh, all these, like the entity list restriction, all it means is these U.S. companies just need to get a license from the Commerce Department, and the Commerce Department basically approves everything. They approved something like 94% in 2020? Yeah, which, of... and like only like a fraction of all the trade uh, that happens between the U.S. and China is even being reviewed. Well, because only a fraction needs to be according to the entity list, right? Because there's only like 70 companies on the entity list. And yeah, according, and, and this is crazy because according to uh, one Washington, D.C.-based analytics firm, uh, like there are tens of thousands of Chinese companies that should be on the entity list, but there's only like 70. Right. Wh whereas well, they said should... Could be like could be yeah yeah like it's not necessarily all ten thousand but like that there's probably more than seventy right yeah. but, but there's a corollary to this which is Iran where every Iranian company is essentially on the entity list even though they don't call it that it's that like U.S. companies can't trade with Iranian companies because we have this this these strict full trade restrictions on that whole authoritarian country. And it's similar with North Korea. So, like, it's not a thing we that the United States can't do. Uh, it's well, just a, it's a thing the United States essentially is making a an exception for China, for the whole country. And the result is American companies are giving China the sensitive military technology well, that no, they we're, need. We're selling it to them. <laughs> that's better. Chris. That's it's <laughs> that's true. It supports U.S. We're, companies. We really in the are extreme short term. We really are selling the rope. Leadership. We really are selling them the rope that they will use to hang us. I'm. I don't know if rope is on the entity list. It should be. It's probably a technology that. That's the other thing well, that happens. If it was happens. a hemp rope, there'd be lots of restrictions on it. <laughs> if it's a technology that's deemed old enough, even though it can still be used by military co applications, then it. Um, doesn't get restricted in so the like same a, way. So like a club with nails in it. Well, I mean, I don't think we're well, selling that to China, but no, certain the, the, semiconductors, well, yeah. yeah. Certain semiconductors and also equipment used to, to make semiconductors is okay. Yeah. But yeah. The most sensitive semiconductors, oh no, those are, you, you can only sell those to private Chinese companies. Unless you get a license, which will get approved anyways. Right. And not only that, the commerce by the commerce department's own rules. I'm choking on my rage and bile. Uh, but the commerce department's own rules: if a U.S. company just makes whatever it is outside of the U.S., then they they can sell it to China. Any company they want doesn't matter. Yeah, the entity list doesn't apply. You know what this tells me, Shelley? Hmm. The commerce department is full of deep state commies. I actually don't think that's why. Why do you think that? Is there is there any possible other explanation? I think the other possible explanation is that the Commerce Department uh, is their mandate is to be the Commerce Department, right? Like their mandate is to promote U.S. trade around the world, and they're not equipped to uh, essentially deal with the fact that one of our biggest trading partners is an authoritarian regime. Well, this is the weird that, thing because, like, the State Department, the Energy Department, the Defense Department—they all know the risk. Yeah. China and like they are trying to tell the Commerce Department 
what they're doing. And I do think that specifically some people in the Commerce Department know of the risk. Like, I do think that, for example, the U.S. Trade Representative's office has always been better on trade, like on certain things related to China trade, especially since the Trump administration. But uh, like when you have, for example, Treasury or um, some of the Commerce Department leadership, it's obvious that they're more worried about, you know, promoting U.S. trade, promoting the economy, you know, the money side of the thing. And that's the, and why I'm always very kind of hesitant whenever, um, you know, it's implied that we should have the finance people set up any part of China policy. Well, because uh, the 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 Commerce Department's line on this is, well, we're we're promoting long term strategic competition with China by allowing all of this trade. It it makes American technology and that's not what they said. Yeah, they did. No, it's they said they were they were focused on long term competition with China, but they weren't uh, defending the licensing to the. Like, I don't think they had a comment on that, basically. Well, no, they were saying that, like, their their goal is to uh, promote America. I forget what they... they yeah, the promote, promote, American technology. promote American technology thing was a separate yeah, it's, thing it's, in the Wall Street Journal article where that person was responding to Matt Pottinger, who used to be National Security Deputy Advisor, saying that the Commerce Department was listening too much to American business leaders when it came to China. Because the business leaders obviously don't care about national security. They want to make money. Yeah. Uh, so the Commerce Department spokesperson was like, oh, we are promoting U.S. technological leadership. And part of that is listening to U.S. technological leaders. So they were defending listening to the business people, uh -huh. but they weren't defending the actual practice of granting all these licenses. I don't know. It sounds like a lot of hand waving. Well, no, I'm just saying that that was like a separate issue from... The entity list. Well, anyways, like the idea that they are somehow promoting U.S. technological leadership or long-term strategic competition with China by allowing basically wholesale selling of uh, sensitive technology to the Chinese Communist Party. I'm not Party saying they're insane. right. I'm just saying that they're not saying this is promoting U.S. technological leadership. I don't think they've come up with any kind of defense for it. It's because the United States does not have a whole of society or whole of government approach to China. And granted, like that's very hard to do in a democracy because a democracy is the way the United States is designed essentially by our founding fathers is to have checks and balances, which ultimately means competing interests that, that prevent a sort of authoritarianism uh, like what the, you know, American colony had felt the, you know, England had become. But the the problem is then it makes it very hard to coordinate sometimes on really important issues. But the U.S. can do it because the U.S. has done it on Iran. The U.S. has done it on North Korea. And the U.S. is largely doing it on Russia, although there's many issues there. For example, we still buy like refined uranium from Russia, even though we would never buy their oil anymore because that's horrible. But like, like you, there is, there are the tools to do it. There is the, a, the political willpower potentially to make it happen. It's just not coalesced into anything. Yeah, I don't think that we're at the point where, um, the, any U.S. administration would be like, we need to stop all trade with China. Right. The way we do with Iran. But and that's it's we're in so deep, right? And so. Now to do that would cause such unbelievable pain to our economy that I I don't know if that actually would be the case. Well, I think that's the fear, right? I, and I I actually do believe that I, I it think would short be, term there would definitely be some pain. Th there'd be a lot. Like I, like think about all the pain that we experienced over the last two and a half years of COVID because of China supply chain problems, right? And it's it's a it affected different things at different times. Right. But like, you know, certain things, you, you know, are really hard to get and whatever. And so you're going to deal with that pain. Uh, and then after you get through the pain, it's not going to hurt anymore. 
because the short of China. term pain is nothing compared to the long term consequences. Well, I mean, the right. long term consequences is essentially a war with China that would be devastating both economically and, you know, TV. Right. Yeah. Well, the, I think the bigger problem of, of not separating from the, the China trade is that decoupling or decoupling you know. is that when China invades Taiwan, uh, because like if there's still like this unbelievable amount of trade, there's going to be so much political resistance and so much business resistance to supporting Taiwan that it, like it'll be very hard for the U.S. to to do what it needs Which to do. Which you saw in 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 Europe, since so many European countries were so tied to the Russian economy, there was a lot of resistance to doing anything to uh, prevent the invasion of Ukraine. Right, and I think there's this there's excuse that oh, if you know, Western Europe or if the United States sends actual troops to Ukraine, then we can't do that because then we risk nuclear war. But I don't think that that's actually the main reason. And, you know, this is somewhat speculative. I acknowledge that. But I think that there's a sort of general reluctance to just get in too deep um, because you know, ultimately the U.S. still wants to be able to trade with Russia later and do, you know, again, we do have some, you know, not a lot of countries sell you refined uranium that we do need for our power plants. I mean, it is possible to get from Canada, for example. Yeah. So it's basically between one authoritarian country and Russia. But uh, Shelly, you ready to quit yet? Mm, getting uh, there. All uh, right, the pressure's building. Keep at it, Matt. Yeah, we got this. But <laughs> at, at any rate, like I, I do think that there's there's more reasons that are more complex and political than simply fear of nuclear war, and I think a lot of that has to do with business interests and trade interests. Well, I think we need to salami slice decoupling. I agree that's, with that. Yeah, that's good. I mean, but, uh, we we started right. I mean the. A few years ago, we started with sort of trying to slice off uh, trade with uh, companies that operated in Xinjiang. Uh, the White House had, had sanctioned a bunch of companies that were doing that were directly tied to the concentration camps in Xinjiang. So I wonder how much the Commerce Department is enforcing that. Well, I don't know either. But like again, like that's a, that's a that's we're salami about slicing. to um, let's see the Xinjiang. Uh, like slave labor bill is about to go into enforcement. Mm. So right. that'll be interesting to see if that makes a difference. Yeah. The next step would be any company that has uh, used laborers from Xinjiang, although that's very hard to track. Uh, and then, you, yeah, you can gradually, you know, any any Chinese company that has sold to Xinjiang or like, and you can, you can, you can do that gradually enough. Yeah. Well, Shelley, what was your idea? You you brought up the salami slicing in terms of decoupling. Well, that, uh, you know, we know we are going to need to decouple uh, from China. I'm, I'm not sure if we can do it fully right now, but I don't think we can do it fully in one go. Like, that's just unrealistic as a term of, like, U.S. government policy and in terms of, like, practically speaking, you know, people aren't going to just be able to pull out. Yeah. Uh, but... We should be encouraging businesses to come back to the U.S. Like Japan did this thing, right, where they were they offering incentivized it. financial incentives to companies for coming back to Japan. Um, there's also this concept of friendshoring that's being talked about a lot right now, where the idea is to pull out of like Russia and China and places like that. But to even if you can't bring everything back to the U.S., like if you get your supply chains through friendly countries to the U.S., like for example, Taiwan, yeah. you know, you're not going to have to worry about uh, essentially something like the Chinese Communist Party nationalizing 3M by forbidding them from exporting face masks back in the middle to the of U.S. A pandemic. in the middle of a pandemic when we had no face masks. Yeah, yeah. so they hoarded it. But like, so that's the kind of thing where you don't want your supply chains to be controlled by authoritarian regimes that you are in a conflict with. Like that just sounds so basic, but it's going to take gradual steps to get there. And I think it's going to have to be a combination of some government regulation because some businesses are just not going to do it unless you make them. Mm -hmm. And then some, uh, you know, 
positive incentives too. And I think also the more that U.S. consumers are looking to not buy things made in China, uh, that will pressure certain types of companies to right. move their manufacturing. But there's not always the option. Like, okay, so Apple manufactures a lot of iPhones in China. And in fact, the ones that are sold in the U.S. market are manufactured in China still. But iPhones sold in India, a lot of them are manufactured locally in India. Same with Brazil. A lot of those are, are sold in, in parts of Latin America. Yeah. So they have... I Apple has diversified its manufacturing to other countries. But as a US consumer, I only have a choice to buy, if I want an iPhone and I'm not willing to fly to another country to get it, I basically am getting a made in China one. Right. But if I as a consumer had the option like, okay, let's say uh, there's a new iPhone model that's $1,200, or I could pay $1,250 or $1,300 to have it to, to buy one made in India or Brazil, right? Like as long as the difference is small enough, and I think actually it is, um, as long as like, it, I think the difference in cost is small enough that if, if Apple were to present an option, uh, they would quickly see that there's a substantial number of consumers who would pay 5% more uh, or maybe even 10% more to get it in a French short country and not China. I think that something to do with technology is also an issue of Apple is, you know, most of their supply chain was in China for well over a decade. So yeah. they only recently started to diversify and like put manufacturing in, in India, right? right? So if they can build out that manufacturing, right. then it would be more likely to have that those iPhones go to the other parts of the world. And, and maybe that is what Apple's planning just because it's so difficult for them to operate in China, they found. And I, I don't know what Apple's internal discussions are. No, but I think it is going to be, China is going to be helping us with this decoupling thing, actually, because it is going to get increasingly hard to do business in China. Uh, right. Because, Wait, hard to do business in a communist country? Well, it's going to get worse. Well, when they were welcoming everyone, it mm. wasn't that hard, right? But... Um, they were just stealing from you behind yes. your back. But now, you know, there's like the shutdowns from COVID, the zero COVID policy, um, shutdowns from things like the heat wave, like they're, they're losing more and more factory workers. Yeah. Like it's, oh, it's more and more expensive to I did, do that, to labor in China. Yeah. I did also want to, at some point talk about, because this reminded me. Uh, how the real estate crisis is mm -hmm. affecting everything. But please carry on with your Yeah, point. well, so my point is that it is going to get more difficult to have your supply chain be completely in China, and it's going to get more expensive. And that will also incentivize other countries to move their supply chains to Southeast Asia or South America or, like, different places, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Like, will it become just so unbearable for U.S. corporations in China uh, combined with like Americans becoming aware of like, we don't want anything to do with China. And will that create natural pressure to get out of China or will it have to get to the point of an open conflict? I think a lot of it has to do with the, the cost of moving out of China for like an individual company, like the cost of leaving China because they're already so, like so invested in it it can often be very expensive for them to leave. Or you have and, a lot of suppliers there and now you right. have to redo your entire supply chain. Right, so like, I'll give an example. And we did an episode about this, I think in like January of 2020 uh, with Mova Globes, which was sponsoring China Uncensored with the, actually we have the, the Globes in the background, a few of them. And what was interesting about that is, so, so they had been our sponsor before, but then they like, they told me privately on the phone their whole story. And then I asked them like, hey, could we make an episode about this? Because it's so interesting. And well, it agreed. began because we noticed they had, they were printing nine dash lines on their maps. Right. And but, so we approached them. Uh, yeah. Uh, but ultimately, like w what their story was is that they had, you know, they're um, initially Taiwanese based manufacturing. And then they found it to be, oh, like they had this incentive to move to China and make it cheaper. But like, gradually it got harder and harder for them. Like first they, um, you know, there were like these 
they could do kind of what they wanted, but they were told that they had to print the not China's nine dash line on it, but it wasn't enforced. And then gradually the enforcers came and they were checking their, their maps printed on their globes. And then later the enforcers were like, oh, you know, even your historical maps of like the world from, you know, that are like recreations of these like 15th, 16th century maps have to like, they don't, you can't do that because uh, that doesn't meet our current map guidelines. And Mo was like, like, firstly, these are ancient maps. And also we're not even like a map company. We're just a, like, we make decorative globes. Like we're not trying to make political maps that represent with some perfect accuracy, whatever. It's just like, these are decorative. And the Chinese inspectors like, we don't care. And then MOVA ultimately like had all these frustrations because they couldn't even print some of the stuff that they were that had been making. But then when they left, like the Chinese regulars like locked up all their factories. And so they had like all this equipment that they they lost. They lost the factories, they lost a bunch of inventory. And so that that was the price that they had to pay essentially to move manufacturing out of China. And, and they moved, I think, a lot of it uh, back to Taiwan. Uh, and then they could print, you know, whatever. They'd stop printing the nine dash line, obviously, because that was stupid. Uh, but that, like, they lost, I, I, they didn't tell me how much it was, but, you know, a company could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. They could lose millions. They could lose, uh, you know, hundreds of millions if it's a big company like Apple. Like, or, as in many companies, just completely lose their market and go out of business. Right. Because and then also Chinese they lose off. the China market. Like, MOVA lost the China market because they're not printing the nine dash line. They can't sell in China. But for MOVA, they're like, it doesn't, like, that's not our big market. So it doesn't matter. But for Apple, like Apple, there's a huge market for iPhones. I think that's the only place where they still have growth. I'm not hundred percent sure of that. Well, yeah. Cause everyone in America who's going to get an iPhone has an iPhone basically. Right. And so, so yeah, like, like what is Apple going to do? If they lose, it's not just the manufacturing, it's the whole being able to sell there. And if you pull out, then you get punished. Adi like any way the Chinese Communist Party could punish Apple for pulling out of China, they will. And it'll be like, they, they block the market, they like take away the app store. They do like anything, they, they'll, they'll block the sale of other Apple products. Uh, they might even punish suppliers that just work tangentially with Apple. They could arrest, uh, you know, Chinese Apple employees. Like that's happened with, uh, that's happened before, Rio Tinto, right. Australian they, company. They, they could, they could, yeah. And then, then they blame Apple for, for all of that. And so Apple gets bad press for some reason. So like all these consequences. You're making decoupling sound very bad. Yeah, <laughs> it, well, it, it is potentially really bad. What we just have to understand is that it's a no pain, no gain situation. I do think that's true that there needs to be kind of some kind of realistic talk about what the, the consequences, the sacrifices of some of this stuff is. But and also, a timeline. Yeah, and, but also what the consequences of not doing it. Yeah, that be. needs to be clearer. Right? I, I think the problem is that, you know, no administration, like you, you, this is why also people don't talk about war. Like in Taiwan, it is kind of unpopular politically for any... Um, political party to uh, talk about, you know, too much stuff related to an actual war in Ch with China, because even though people know that it's a possibility, nobody wants to actually confront that. Right. right? And then also like, you know, we can't predict when it's going to come. So if you, if you say, oh, well, war is likely to come by 2027 or something, and then you're wrong, you're politically really screwed. But here's the thing about, just to kind of go back to Apple, like, so th there's lots of consequences for them pulling out of China now, and I've talked about them. Here's the consequence when China invades Taiwan is uh, the Chinese Communist Party nationalizes all of Apple's factories and inventory uh, and potentially arrests a bunch of Apple employees, including foreigners could be who are in Taiwan to oversee factories could be detained in prison indefinitely. Sorry, are you talking about in Taiwan or in, in, in China? China? Okay. So like the because the US and China would essentially be at be war. at war. So then so then app you know, Apple management who may be US citizens or 
Taiwanese citizens are now uh, essentially political prisoners, prisoners of war almost. Uh, and and Apple loses everything ever anyway, right? So it's it's when 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 there's a war, Apple loses everything they're going to lose. Uh, you know, if China punishes them for pulling out now, plus they also lose a whole bunch of other things. It's yeah, it's it's an immediate pain versus like decoupling can be done gradually to yeah. sp- parse it out. Well, yeah, it, and it's just like the overall like. It's it's kind of known what the pain is now, but what we just have to remember is that all the pain that everyone faces by decoupling before there's a war is going to be all that pain plus a bunch more things if the decoupling isn't done before the war, right? Oh, but maybe there won't be a war and, and then you can just keep making money in China. Right, and so as long as you believe that that the Communist Party is like you, you, to believe there's not going to be an attempt on Taiwan is basically to believe all of the lies from the you know like foreign ministry as being true, but to then also n- like not believe the white papers that or China's own internal documents that say they're going to take Taiwan. Oh I mean, no, no, but but peacefully if possible. Right. And so like it, it, it's just this, you have to ignore reality to such an extent and it, think the lies are true and the truth are lies. It's, it's, it's almost so unbelievable. You, you'd think the only explanation is that the people doing this must be deep state commies. I mean, yes. I think she's just reached a Zen state of enlightenment. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, this is a state of nirvana you're witnessing right here. I wouldn't call this nirvana. <laughs> I would not call this nirvana. <laughs> just come as you are. Uh, 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 yes, I would like to talk about some of the real estate issues that we brought up this week, because we, we have a little bit of time. Uh, that um, episode is actually going to come out. The same day as this podcast. Hey, how about that? So go over to China Uncensored if you weren't already and check out uh, a, g- a full breakdown on China's real estate I don't think crisis. It's, I don't think it's the podcast driving people to this. You never know. <laughs> um, but yeah, because this, uh, this also ties on to the issue of decoupling because, you know, China's economy is not what it was or what it seems to be. And so, Matt, I know you did a lot of the the research on. Yeah. Well, there's a there's a bunch of stuff that made it into the episode, and also a bunch of stuff that didn't make it into the episode. Ooh. Uh, so, but this is why you need to watch China Unscripted and not just China Uncensored. So there's there's huge protests in China over the um, real estate crisis, but the the background to those protests are, is actually more interesting because y- you have a a development crisis. Like China's real estate development is essentially an estimated 30% of China's GDP. So- A big amount. It's it's so big that that the Chinese Communist Party absolutely cannot afford to lose it or even lose half of it. It's too big to fail. Well, it is, right? And so there's, you know, different attempts at bailouts or sort of quasi roundabout bailouts. Um, but these real estate companies uh, are, instead of building an apartment complex and then selling units, they say they're going to build it. They build a little model. They bring people over to the exhibition and say, oh, buy a unit now to sort of keep your place in it. And, and people- that's, that's not totally unheard of though. It's not totally unheard of, but in China, 90% yeah, that's a of, lot. of apartment units are- being resold. And I say apartments. I, in America, you'd probably say condos because they're being owned. Yeah. But they, I don't know if they still call them apartments, which you, which you buy. But just to be clear, we're talking about the purchase of units uh, for ownership and not and not rental. Yeah. But it's um, not the fact that they're not built yet that makes the whole thing right. crazy. It's, so so what, what uh, finances real estate development is the selling of units. So they if they're going to build an apartment complex with 100 units, they need 
the sale price of the 100 units to exceed the cost of building that those buildings, plus all the other management expenses, I think I'm getting lost in a lot of the details. Yeah. And so like, like that's the way developers make money is by selling units. But the problem is that Evergrande and Shamao and all these other big developers, like they'd been raising money through a bunch of other things. So uh, one is by listing, uh, you know, stocks, uh, which is it's it's which is okay because that's kind of generally how com- companies raise capital, uh, and it comes with its own problems. But also, they were selling financial products, which we didn't talk about in the episode. Yes, that is but, actually a big problem. So it's like it, you kind of buy these complex things, like okay, uh, I will buy a wealth management product from Evergrande for which they promise to pay me back with some good interest rate. Uh, You're basically it, it's, loaning your money to Evergrande. Right. And yeah. and in return, you have a promise of you know somewhat more money coming, right? Because it's it's a yeah. it's a return Let's with interest. Let's say the bank would give you like 2% or something. Right, but and this wealth management project might twenty percent, something crazy, like yeah, yeah. Uh, which is essentially like buying a bond in a company, or maybe a junk bond, right? Because junk bonds essentially are just bonds that are high high risk, high reward, right? Uh, but you don't know they're high risk because you don't, for some reason, see this real estate crisis coming. Well, but, I mean, I think it's because wealth management products like this are pretty common in China. This is like a big problem with their debt industry, right? Yeah, well, and that's that's a whole other issue, although it's quite tied together. Well, I'm just saying that like, it's not un, like for oh. like the average Chinese person to think that this is sketchy, like you right. might not. Uh, yeah, also like the US has done a whole bunch of wealth management products, although a lot of them are just invested in by corporate investors. Okay, so I think we're losing let's, the let's, plot let's, a little bit. We are because I was about long, to go into the 2008 ago. real estate so, crisis. But like, well, like, okay, so hold on, my hell. Let, I think we just need to simplify. No, it. No, let me just. So, so here's the simplification: these companies, developers, should be making money by selling units, but they're also raising money by all these other methods that are essentially them borrowing money, for which they have to pay that back plus with interest. And uh, that they started to get over leveraged because they were they were borrowing so much money and had to, and then they had to pay out so much with interest and they weren't getting enough from the selling of units to handle all that uh, and they really shouldn't have been doing it anyway because ultimately they don't make money by loaning by by they don't they don't make money by borrowing money they lose money by that and so they they these developers ended up in this situation where they just had this whole cluster of, of debt. And then- uh, They couldn't sell they, enough they units to cover it. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> and, uh, and then it's affecting, because they're not finishing this construction in hundred, over a hundred cities in China, uh, not only are people not able to move into their homes, but it's affecting all these other aspects of the economy that are tied to real estate. Well, I think also the part of the problem is that people aren't just like people are already paying a mortgage on a on an apartment that they don't live in, or like they've already paid. Yeah, they've they bought paid, an apartment. They bought an apartment, they apartment don't have, and now they exist. want the money back. Yeah, and because the money's not gone. Complete it. Right, like the money is just like the there's no money there. There's no apartment there. Right. If 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 Evergrande can't. Uh, they don't, have, they the don't have the money to, to build, build the apartments. Then they don't have the money to refund what people have already paid. And anyway, it's kind of like the they were actually a lot of the money comes through the banking system because people have mortgages. They're not just paying in cash. Well, so the the, the big picture now is that you have all of these individual Chinese people who have, have spent, paid money for something they're never going to get. These big real estate companies don't have the money to complete construction or pay off their debt. Uh, this is thirty percent of China's GDP, essentially the yeah. real estate market. If you especially also consider like construction, like all of the things, all the yeah. other businesses, furniture makers, uh, painters, landscapers. That's plumbers. probably yeah, but like it's mostly it's the, mostly the money that's being pumped into the developers, right? Right. Yeah. But but a a project completed only halfway 
that doesn't create livable units is essentially completely money down the drain. Not to mention that it is actually worse because you have this half-built building that is now like deteriorating, right? Because right. it's not finished. And it's also taken up farmland uh, or land that could be used for other things, right? I mean, most cities are essentially built on what used to be farmland, right? Because you just gradually take over the farms and you, you know, build. No, no, no. So, uh, well, so yeah, this is an economic disaster. And on top of it, uh, you know, you have the issue where like people are protesting, obviously. This is like one of the most significant protest movements. Some people have compared it like it's the biggest since 1989 Tiananmen. It's just not like a horde of people in a location. In a location. Yeah. yeah, people are protesting by not paying their mortgages or whatnot. But as we as we mentioned in this episode, that you know China has a social credit system, and you can be penalized for things like not paying on your mortgage. And so this could affect people being able to get loans, get mortgages in the future, which then just creates a spiral of people not being able to afford homes. Real estate developers aren't able to sell homes, and then you just get into this negative feedback loop where the Chinese economy it, just implodes. It's also especially bad because traditionally a lot of the wealth that people accumulate, they put into real estate. They don't, That's like the only real investment source for Chinese well, people. Well, now they have all these crazy wealth management products too, yeah. So, which are also run by the real estate developers. So there's a lot of ways in which people are getting scammed out of their money. Mm -hmm. uh, but but like, people used to think with good reason that real estate prices would always go up. Yes, they like real estate always seemed to be the safe place to put money. Uh, and yeah, that's when that's why when people, you know, find out that they cannot get that apartment or the money back or like they will protest. It, they will go in person. Evergrande had a problem with their wealth management products. Mm -hmm. Earlier, was it this year or last year, where like essentially people went to the offices and protested? Some of the workers at at the real estate company actually were. I think it was the tail end of last year. Yeah, were protesting there because they had been pressured into buying these wealth management products. Oh yeah, from their employer, and then they weren't getting the money back. Yeah, and you know, tying this back to what we were saying about decoupling, like if if Chinese people like just now don't have money, can't like afford, don't have homes, they're not going to be buying iPhones. They're good, like this this China market. There's like this illusion of a China market where, oh, there's 1.4 billion people. Imagine if just half of that bought your product. Mm -hmm. It's it's like this illusion that there is this infinite market there when the reality is there is even now still loads of poverty in China. You have an economy that is basically a gigantic bubble ready to burst at any point. So the idea that there's like all this wealth to be made in China. Right. Well, I mean, even among the 1.4 billion people, 0.9 of that, 0.9 billion, 900 million people are living in what by American standards would be absolute poverty. Less than $10 a day, less than $10 a month. I think it's, it's less. No, it's $10 a less, day. Less than 10 a day. Yeah, but a month would, a month be, would be terrible. Like that but was, also less than 10 a day is terrible by the, the standards of anyone living in any of the developed countries. Uh, and so- like China is still by and large a very poor country, but has this, like the people who are buying these apartments are among a much smaller portion, but a small portion of China that includes a middle class is still a hundred million. Still or, like or, the population of the US or something. Right, you know? well, a hundred million is bigger than, you know, the UK and Australia combined, right? So that's, that's a lot of people to still buy iPhones. Uh, but those But those are the people who are also getting ripped off in this housing Have you guys crisis. heard of run philosophy? No. It's this uh, thing, this, um, it's, you know, like some of these trends like lying flat or oh, like, okay. like run philosophy is about trying to get out of China <laughs> as quickly as possible. Really? Yeah, it's something that's been trending lately. Uh, there was an interesting CNN article that was about this. Yeah, this is an extreme example because he is a poor, uh, like blue collar worker, but he essentially, um, wanted to get out of China so badly that he flew to Ecuador mm -hmm. uh, and then did the Central American like like refugee route through Mexico Whoa. and entered at the southern U.S. border. Like illegally or? Illegally. Le okay. And is applied to for asylum. Wow, that's, that's But he had been intense. documenting this trip for months on Twitter. Whoa. Uh, but he just like left 
he's divorced and he just like left his two kids with his parents in China and didn't tell him. He told him that he was going to find work in another city. Technically could be true. <laughs> it was true, kind of. It did not tell him that them that he was like trying to escape to America. Oh my God. But like that's a, but most people who are doing run philosophy are middle class, upper middle class, well, white collar people. We've been talking people. about naked officials for years yeah. who are trying to get their family and yeah. their monies out of China. But like I think run philosophy, especially this year is, is a, like a tr new term for it because mm -hmm. of the COVID lockdown in Shanghai really like scared a lot of people because Shanghai is wealthy and, you know, uh, if people could be treated like that in Shanghai, you know. The, the, uh, yeah. And like the fact that, you know, this year the the unemployment rate for the youth is like at 19 percent, a little higher, I think. It's just it's it's a bleak, grim future facing most of China's youth. Yeah, and I think that's why you can see a lot of people trying to get into, like, grad programs overseas, like, trying to get any way they can Get out, out. of Dodge. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's not... I think this is only get a problem that's going to get worse, and I wonder how this is going to square with the fact that, it, according to several reports, it seems that they're trying to limit passports or, like, revoke people's passports or cut They're really trying passports. to turn it into a giant prison. It's, yeah. it's becoming like North Korea. It's not clear how widespread that is, but that's that's definitely happened. And what I wonder is when you have all of these, like, um, like a, a mass exodus of, like, Chinese people leaving China because they, and they come to the U.S. and are like, my gosh, the Chinese Communist Party, all of that is awful. How much of a how much will that impact American society? Will that be a big impotence for like sort of the sea chain we need for U.S. companies to be like, you know, maybe China isn't a safe investment. Well, maybe I mean, we if, should decouple. I think it could affect China more directly because, like the one of the, the the reasons why the overseas Chinese community has by and large not had a big impact on liberalizing China or or overthrowing the CCP is that so much of the Chinese diaspora is still economically connected to China, still wants to travel back to China. They have business ties there. I mean, there are certainly a, quite a number of Chinese dissidents uh, and, and political refugees, but like by and large, that's not like the main thrust of the Chinese overseas community. A lot of mainland Chinese are, you know, very wealthy right. people who benefited from this. Exactly. System. But for example, uh, in the 1970s uh, and 80s, uh, f overseas Filipinos were by and large against the Marcos regime. This is not the current president Marcos, but the, his father, the previous Marcos, who was a dictator. Um, but my point is that like all the overseas Filipino newspapers were like super anti-Marcos and there was this big like overseas Filipino like drive to to end dictatorship and bring democracy to the Philippines and ultimately it worked, uh, and the Philippines, you know, for all its its issues, which are which are very real, but it still has a much better functioning democracy now than it did under under under, under, the, dictatorship. That Mar under Marcos, <laughs> right? Uh. And so that was largely thanks to the overseas community. In fact, in China, uh, during the the end of the Qing Dynasty, uh, it was a lot of overseas Chinese who, you know, were people leaving China, getting educated and, and wanted to overthrow the Qing. And, and a lot of people were working on it from overseas. Yeah. Right, like, you know, Hawaii and in different places. And so uh, like that that change, like if, if you just get a critical mass of overseas Chinese who have left China under circumstances where they don't want to go back, they don't think they're going to ever be able to do business there, uh, th that's much more likely to be uh, a positive force for change in China or from the Communist Party's perspective, an existential threat. I do think that there was a brief period of time in which that was the case. Uh, it was just that the Chinese diaspora was much smaller, which is in the immediate aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yeah. I mean, you went to that protest march with your father in 1989, right? Yeah. And I, like my dad was apolitical, essentially. And he was planning on going back to China after he, completing his PhD because that's what he was supposed to do, right? Uh, but the after, like the Tiananmen Square Massacre changed a lot of people's minds, and there was such popular support for Chinese students and stuff at the time. But um, 
when there wasn't a lot of Chinese uh, in the U.S. or in a lot of other countries, like not compared to now. And also, um, it just, like, the, the CCP was able to essentially put on this whole thing about how they were changing and, you know, like the economic liberalization and did deals with U.S. businesses, convinced the U.S. government officials that they were going to open up, you right. know. They didn't need much convincing. No, right. no, no. But like this, this, like it was a very different um, overall situation than how the world saw Marcos, right? Right. But also what, what's interesting is, is you mentioned that like, you know, China had just been starting to, to liberalize and, and your parents came in like the early 80s to the US, right? Yeah, mid 80s. Mid 80s. Uh, and that was after the 1978 was was the Gaiga Kaifeng, the reform and opening up under Deng Xiaoping, right? Uh, before that, what happened uh, when people in China wanted to leave. They couldn't, by and large, they could not leave because China at that time was a giant prison. So it's like, it's easy to see that like, you know, for a substantial amount of the PRC's history, the communist party had kept China as a giant prison from which you could not escape or is extremely difficult to escape. And like, they may do it again because it's the same communist party. They just might use different, different rules or different reasoning. The passports restrictions that Shelley was mentioning. Yeah. So like, I'm just saying, like, I, I agree with you. And it's not hard to believe because China was once a giant prison. Well, this is why I think in the, in the end, I mean, like just looking at like how the U.S. Commerce Department is doing things, I don't have much hope that the U.S. is really ever going to get its act together to stand up to the Chinese Communist Party on a societal level. I think what ultimately will bring about the change is you know, Chinese people themselves, like through this kind of diaspora movement and just the fundamental corruption and ineptitude of the Chinese Communist Party, I think it's going to be a situation like the Soviet Union where, you know, till the day it collapses, you will have people in the West saying, oh, well, this is going to be around forever. We have to learn to work with them. I mean, I think there are going to be those people. Yeah. Are they always going to be the people in power? I don't know about that. Yeah, and we'll have to see what comes first. And Shelly, I need to congratulate you. You did not quit. Hmm. You're not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. Not a quitter. Neither are you if you watched to the end of this episode. So thank you for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelly Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And we'll talk to you next time.